Yes. And, What's your uh, name again? I'm Charles Ackeson. Charles. Your Hubble mission, you were the payload commander, yeah. and that was one of the most exciting missions. Um, tell me a little, about, a little bit about what it took to help repair and, and correct Hubble's vision. Well, what it took was the 18 years I put into Hubble, starting in 1975. So the real heroics were on the ground, not, except for two little surprises. They were important surprises, but um, we executed up there what we had planned on the ground. And so and what we planned on the ground was an extension of what I did for 18 years. They told me in 75, look after Hubble, even before it had a name or before congressional approval. They told me to come up with the tools and the procedures to uh, identify every possible failure it could get into, come up with the tools and procedures to take care of it with a spacewalk. So the robotic question had not been raised. It was raised after SDS-125 was canceled after Columbia. We're not going back there because they're not in the same plane. You can't get the Hubble and get the space station because of the plane the plane difference. With time, then the STS-61 mission, and there wasn't one then, but with time, the evolution of failures, one after another, um, the evolution of failures started to build STS-61, and it became, a, it became a 61 with more and more failures. Mm -hmm. The agency knew it was going to have to go up and, uh, and fix it. Um, with the uh, rep uh, subsequent repair of Hubble and the images started coming back, what were your moments, what were your thoughts as you saw the new images coming out of Goddard? <clears throat> well, I knew, I knew we hadn't done our job until they took that time period to, you know, to outgas it from our being there, you know, to cleanse it in the vacuum. And I knew it took time, and until we saw the pictures, we did what we had to do, but it didn't mean that all the corrections were okay. It didn't mean that uh, that the co-star was going to do its job. And you know, we did our part, but still, the co-star was a deployment of all the little, you know, the optical bench, the quarter-sized mirrors, and uh, was the corrections that were inherent to with Big Two, were they correct? And they were. Uh, so, but you know, you have to test those things. So the new gyros. Yeah, well, the new we knew the rays. gyros were okay. Yes, we knew they were okay because they told us right after installation on EV one. They told us yeah. they're all working. I didn't know how to put in faulty gyros, so they. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know they were. I thought they were giving me good gyros. <laughs> so, <laughs> we don't do that one. Okay. Well, no. It's just, you know, they've already demonstrated they're not good. So I put in more of the same, and they failed too. So I don't know why, but I know why they failed. I thought I'd put in good ones. Anyhow, but on EVA day one, uh, they told us, uh, Harbaugh told us immediately that, they spun up and are working fine. Good. I the solar rays had a lot of good insulation on them, so um, that was but, a... uh, yeah. But we so it still takes time, you know, to have it do some cycles in the sun to show the vibrations are gone. And so, but um, but really, the images I had to get home and see. I saw M one hundred was the first one that I saw. No, it was not the first one where I didn't. It's the first one I saw, so I wasn't there in uh, the science center to see that point of light and to see the folks there. And their ex I saw that later, their exuberation, they knew right off. And as soon as the image popped up for them, they knew, they knew the fix was there. And so, Well, as Hubble looks and gazes... Um through millions of years of history upon billions. Um, yeah. What, I want you to explain a little bit about your thoughts on the Big Bang Theory. Was there a beginning? <clears throat> Was there an end? Will there be an end? Well, I don't believe in, uh, 
I don't believe in quite in the Big Bang the way um, maybe other people do. I think they're trying to change their thinking. I think their, their thinking is going to change. So I think it's a, no question it's a singularity in energy and time. But I do not think it's the beginning. I think there was all kinds of precursors to the Big Bang. There was the universe before the Big Bang. There was stuff there. And the Big Bang was some kind of singularity. But it gets down to the, um, the nature of the human being. It has to have a beginning. And so it, it's not really an anthropocentric error. It's maybe slightly an anthropocentric error in that the anthropocentric errors come from when we thought the universe went around Earth and it was the center of all. So that's kind of a Copernican shift you go through, you know. And then you have Darwin and you have relativity and you have Heisenberg and it's continuous growth from the anthropocentric error or even uh, that we are the only living creatures in the universe, the only uh, intelligent creatures, the only life form, you know, that's all anthropocentric thinking. And so I think it's massively important to accept the other and accept life out there and accept people doing interstellar travel and all that. It's part of our growth, where we fit, where we fit in the universe. So mm -hmm. I think the Big Bang has a slight amount of anthropocentric air in it, in the humans. Uh, the storytelling, there's always a beginning and an end because humans are born and they die. And so there's a beginning and there's an end to everything. What are your thoughts on the COTS program, COTS, and also uh, what <clears throat> SpaceX is preparing to do with the Dragon? Yeah, I think the whole thing is, uh, the whole thing is chaos and a cop-out. And uh, uh, the whole thing is a Washington failure. And uh, when I say Washington, I mean administration, the legislature, Congress, and NASA. That's what I call Washington. It's, they're in total failure. They're in failure in a whole lot of realms, a whole lot of things. So Washington is pretty much in failure now. I think everyone understands that. Do you but it's in total failure when it comes to a space program, mm -hmm. of which COTS is part of that failure, and COTS is sort of a default you know, a default program which is spun out of failure, hmm. put wow. a really good project management, a classical, you know, a project management in place to make it happen on time, on cost, and to meet the performance requirements that you laid down. And that's what I'm accustomed to. And there's no other way to run any kind of program. Apple does it. I keep saying Apple, well, iPod, iPhone, mm -hmm. what? The whole thing, you know, what do you want? Yes, sir. But there's other companies as well. There's other companies that Toyota knows how to do it. There's a whole bunch of people that know how to do, do projects. But that's the classical thing that I'm accustomed to. But you ask today, what is the vision? Hmm? And what is the space vision today? Where is the visionary? And what is the vision? We're not going anywhere. There is no where. There is no what. And there is no when. This is not my perspective. Tell me. Where? There is no where. Are we where is the where? Are we currently set up to design the rocket build the rocket, and I believe we're targeting 2017 for the first flight? Of what? As we leap towards leaving Earth orbit. Is that the vision? Oh, where are we going? Uh, I believe, depending on the political arena where at the time, the moon, the possibly an no, asteroid. No, 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 sir. Who said we're going to the moon? When? NASA administrator. When? There is, sir, um, no, wait a minute. There is no Mars program. Right. None. There is also no moon program. None. It does not, not exist. No. What do you mean not? Uh, not officially. That means, oh, we just have this feeling we might do it someday. Sir, 
There is no Mars program. There is no Moon program. There is no asteroid program. There is nowhere anywhere. And there is no what we're going to do, and there's no when we're going to do it. Or you tell me the what, the where, and the when. Huh? Come on. Tell me. <laughs> Don't have it. <laughs> okay. That's it. There is no program. Correct. I'm sorry. No, it's, it's not my perspective. I want a what, a when, and a where. Mm -hmm. And then I want a project management and make that what, when, and where happen. On cost, on schedule, and meet the performance that you've laid down. I think a lot of America echoes what you're saying. Story Musgrave, uh, you're a six-time shuttle veteran, okay? Flew on five different space shuttle orbiters, okay, which is you're the only astronaut to do that. Um, well, the luck of the draw. It really was. Now, I'd like to just cover two missions, which I'm very interested in. The first one is uh, STS-51F, the abort to orbit. Yeah, it was a great one. Um, it was great a great mission. space lab flight, space lab two. Probably the most aggressive, you know. Yes, sir. Flight. Did the lower altitude yeah. change any of the scientific uh, experiments you were performing? Not that I know of. Okay. We had to replan the whole thing because of astronomy mission. We don't get where you plan to get. They had to replan the whole thing. And for us, it's just where you point things. So following the abort to orbit, they had to replan the whole flight? The whole thing. You're not in the wow. right place. You're not, you're, not where in, you're not where you're supposed to be. Yes, sir. <clears throat> so it's astronomy, and you're pointing. Mm -hmm. You're pointing stuff at the sun and uh, at the sky there. So they had to replan it, but they did. We, now, it did cost us reams and reams of teleprinter. Mm. Uh, we had to, and it, it was teleprinter. Uh, so, you know, we had book after book, uh, the teleprinter rolling by 20 feet a day. And we're doing this and pasting on our flight plan because in the pain in the butt, but we understood it. You know. um, moving over to STS-80. Uh, read a great book by Tom Jones, Skywalking, mm. and he mentions in the book your uh, mid deck or your flight deck adventure during reentry. Uh, yeah. The plasma that you captured uh, for the camera. One, first one to get it. And the first person to ever observe the plasma all the way down. And the video is I got that, but it's not good because I had to ad lib it. Mm. I had to tape a camera to the end of a stick and hold it in a, you know, an overhead window. I, of course, did not have the back windows, you know, because the doors are shut. But, so I got to hold this, and I'm standing up with 80 pounds of gear on and holding the camera so it's not steady. And at the same time I'm doing that, I'm showing a monitor to the flyers uh -huh. so they can enjoy the <laughs> Paramo and Taco, and, mm -hmm. and so, but now I had mature aviators. If I had not mature aviators, they'd have told me to go downstairs and get in my seat. Yes, sir. <clears throat> but these guys are tough. They're mature. They're a generation and a half younger than me, but they know what the hell they're doing. Those are mature aviators. They don't care what story's doing. Yelling and screaming and talking about this and that. They don't care. They focus and concentrate on the flying job they're doing, and they mm -hmm. know I'm into the flying. They ignore him. I'm done with what I got to do now. Enjoy him. Enjoy the scenes. Enjoy the plasma. Okay, I got to go back to work. Tune him out. Go back to work. Uh, so Rommel and uh, and Taco, they were mature aviators. They're confident aviators. I'll tune him out when I got to work, and when I don't have to work, we'll have fun. So those guys had uh, the best of both worlds. They got to do the flying. They got to have the fun. I'm interested in, though, you spent nearly 18 days on orbit. <clears throat> to start feeling the 3G effects standing up, how did your body feel during that moment? Well, it was tough, but it was just 2G. What's 2G? Yeah, it's 2. So that's the peak of entry. It was tough. And Rommel kept looking at me. Says, he says, damn animal, Musgrave. <laughs> he says, you're animal. Because I'm taking G standing up mm -hmm. with 80 pounds of gear and longest shuttle flight. And... Um, it was, uh, you know, I was kind of, I was working. I was working. But you see, I'm adding value. 
No one had seen the plasma. I'm adding value. What can I do to add value to this flight? 